Hey, Naomi, how's it going? Do we do this in Zoom here, or are we moving across to a different platform? Oh, no, it's all in Zoom. <laughs> so can I, I don't know. I'm like, I need to like, I'm like gradually professionalizing this thing. And like, you know, like, yeah. I, I think I will do a new platform that integrates with Zoom. I just have oh, to. No, I mean, I'm, I am a big fan of Zoom. Yeah. It fixes my face. And then it also, I can do the backgrounds that I want to do as well. Yeah. Um, whereas a lot of times, if you go into some of the other um, platforms for video capture, they don't have any of those options. Oh, look at that. Yeah, I like to do that. <laughs> yeah. I love it. I love it. Okay, yeah. very cool. Um, all right. So here, I will give give you the ability to share your screen. Okay. See if that were so. I, I'm going to start it off with. I have like a, a quick, you know, couple slides at the beginning, and then I'll hand it over to you. Okay, lovely. So uh, let me just test that I can do this. There you go. Do you, do you have any audio in yours? Audio, no. Okay. All right. Cool. So that should be. That should it's be just forward. just green. Do you see this bar at the bottom? I do. I do. That's weird. Why is it doing that? I wonder. Usually it doesn't have that. Oh, okay. I had to just click on it. Great. You just pull up my notes. So I've got those up under the camera. There we go. Share my screen again. This is the okay. There you go. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, Are you gonna just click through, just make sure it all's run smooth. Great. Oh man. <laughs> Okay, I just gave you that that sci-fi photo of me. Or the, maybe yeah. The, there was that there was that brief moment of time where I was like, I'm gonna use an avatar. I'm gonna use an AI, avatar. An AI generated avatar. It's so cool. Yeah. yeah. And then people are like, that looks asking funny. Kristen, like, why do we have this AI thing to Josh? I yeah, <laughs> I can send you a new picture. But no, it's so funny. It's like, um, yeah, people people were like, uh, that's not doesn't even really look like you, and uh, it looks pretty intense. <laughs> Cool. All right, so we actually have over 200 RCP, so it should be a really good turnout. That's good. I mean, I sent it to um, our listserv is about, oh, this is weird. Why is this doing this? Geraldine put like all of the transitions in here. <laughs> Just <laughs> What the heck? Um, So I just have to pay attention to. Yeah. 
hopefully if it is it is this a powerpoint or mm, it's a slide stack oh, google slides okay well that's I'll, oh right on that's good yeah so it'll i mean i, I think it's good that you click through it then it'll pick up all the animations are you turn oh you're going to turn them off that's what i was wondering I know. It's, it's just, so funny i'm actually starting oh yeah well I'll look at these i think it's a little too intense for me to even start getting into that i'll just pay attention yeah maybe just let it be yeah it'll be okay i'm like that's a whole like she obviously spent several days planning out those transitions bless her yeah yeah that's so funny. i've actually i've started moving every all of my presentations over to figma um oh interesting yeah it's a pretty great tool actually I've I've always had fun with it. Um, mm -hmm. Victoria and Angel, they they both they've just figured they've just finished their UX training, so they're they're very happy working in Figma. Yeah, yeah, no, it's cool. I I just like it. Just has so much, you know. We can use our brand type, which is mm -hmm. which is really lovely. Yeah. Okay. All right. We have our first our first guest is rolling in, Dermot McCord. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, I am. Um, I'm gonna just go grab a glass of water. Is that yeah? Right? Yeah, do it. We're we're good. Okay, so why don't we just uh, we'll we'll we just back in. in ten minutes. Okay. All right, perfect. All right, great. Fun. I'll see you soon. All right. <laughs> oh, oh, actually, you know me. You know, you know what? Can you give me um? Can you give me back the screen real quick? Or I can. I think I can. Sure. Do it. Yeah. 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 Okay. Cool. I'm gonna. All right. I'll share my own screen here. Get ready for that. Okay. Cool. All right. Excellent. All right. We'll see you in a, I'll see you in a minute. Okay.
Okay, everybody. Uh, all right. Okay. All right. Welcome, everyone. Um, I am just admitting everyone from the waiting room. People are pouring in. Uh, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. Um, we'll get started soon. All right. Let me go and... Naomi, are you able to get on? Let me get you. Okay. So I'm I'm here, uh, Josh. I'm just getting a little notice that the host has stopped my video sharing. So oh my goodness! Okay, let me do the, the power to appear. <laughs> Yeah, the the ho the host is still <laughs> trying to figure out a lot of these things. Yeah, right? the um, oh my goodness! All right, let me uh, let me get your video back on for you. Um, do, 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 do. All right. So I am actually enlisting help. Um, so next week, all of these technical issues should be so far in the past. Okay, let's see. Does that work now? Did it, try it now. Here it comes. Yeah. Oh, friend. Okay. Yeah. Um, I will be furiously uh, admitting people to the waiting room. Um, again, you know, uh, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. Um, feel free to go camera on too, whatever you like. Um, I think it's about 10 03. Why don't we start at like 10 05? Does that sound like a good thing? Yeah. Let everyone roll in and get situated. Yeah. Um, cool. Well, welcome everybody. This should be a it should be a really fun one today. Though. I'm really excited to have everyone here. Thank you, Naomi. This is going to be really fun. Of course. Yeah, I'm excited to see everyone popping up. <laughs> okay. Guests here. Yeah. All right. Oh yeah, I know. I know a bunch of these people. <laughs> so if today if today's deck looks more beautiful than past weeks, I've been stealing all of Blue Cadet's templates. Uh <laughs> <laughs> so it's <laughs> all art is theft right Joe? yeah 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 exactly yeah. exactly just <laughs> <laughs> pull, yeah. pulling various things from various parts of my organization here we go all right let's see 1004 all right give it one more minute all right all right do, 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 do. okay my my wife is directly off screen getting a phone call. <laughs> Doing a cameo. <laughs> okay. Cool. All right. Let's get this thing started, I think. Okay. All right. Uh hello everybody. Uh welcome to Future Spaces. I'm gonna continue to just admit people as we go. Uh, I'm your host, uh, Josh Goldblum. If you have any questions, concerns, thoughts, comments, ideas, uh, feel free to email me at josh at futurespaces.com. Uh, or if you have my Blue Cadet email, josh at bluecadet.com, that also certainly works. Um, a reminder, uh, we're on social media and have a website here. You know what I'm going to do here? I'm going to actually paste those uh, into the chat. Oh, wait, oh no, let me, wait, what the hell is happening here? Meeting group chat. All right, put those in there. So feel free to follow us on all those things. If you wanna be kept up to date uh, with upcoming events, uh, if you wanna know when I actually just post these video recordings uh, live, I that, follow me there and that will help. Um, wanna sponsor Future Spaces. Uh, so we're looking for sponsors um, to kind of honestly uh, help promote, uh, to uh, kind of get the word out, various things. Um, so if you're interested in sponsoring, uh, feel free to reach out. I have a beautiful sponsor deck uh, that I would be happy to send your way. Um, next week, uh, we'll be hosting on a, on Friday, uh, John Simon Jr., who is a legendary digital uh, artist. He is called Code as Canvas, Three Decades in Digital Art. Um, John is a fantastic artist. We're actually doing a project with him over at Art World, um, my other hustle. Um, and he has his work in the collection of the Whitney, the MoMA, Guggenheim. He partnered with Bjork on biophilia. Um, and he'll be talking about 
you know, basically the evolution of generative and digital art over the last 30 years. So it should be a really, really interesting one. Um, so I sent out a newsletter this morning uh, with invite should be up there. Come check it out. Um, but, oh, and also uh, just sort of uh, the rules of the show. Um, we're going to, oh, feel free to be camera on or off your choice. Um, we're recording. So if you are camera on, you might be in a recording. So warning there. Um, I will share them soon. Again, get me sponsorship so I can have pay someone to do this for me because I'm totally <laughs> overextended. Um, add any questions that you have into the Q&A. Um, I'll call on you to ask directly or you know, I can certainly ask for you and then enjoy. Um, but here today, uh, welcoming uh, Naomi Claire Kralin, uh from Storycraft Lab to talk about uh, the fantastic work that they've been doing with Marriott, uh, focusing on the guiding principles and experience design. Um, I had a really fantastic opportunity to uh, sit in on a Story Lab workshop um, with, uh, with, with Naomi and her team. Uh, she's a fantastic presenter, fantastic thinker. I've seen a bit of the presentation, and I think you guys are all in for a treat. Um, so with that, I will hand it over to Naomi. Oh, thanks. Okay, so just Oops. like so let me stop. I will stop my share. <laughs> there we go. All right. Can you see my screen? It's working. Yes. All right. All right. That's amazing. All right, Josh, thank you so much for the intro. It's really lovely to be here with you all today. I'm super excited to talk about this project with you. Uh, this is, and I also should really say thank you to um, the Marriott team <laughs> for uh, asking me to come and present this uh, to everybody as well. They were who we began our journey working with. Before I jump into the, um, the, the full set of insights from the report, I'm going to just give you a little overview of the journey. How do we get involved in this project? Uh, why? Why did we begin doing this work? Um, so Marriott actually has had this series of trends reports um, that get released. And I think we're all kind of in the different industries that we're in aware of trends reports. They tend to land in January, February of each year. Uh, there's this huge onslaught of, uh, of content that gets released. Well, um, the, the trends reports initially started getting produced by Marriott and different partners um, back in 2016. There was a, a release in 2019, uh, and then the pandemic hit, you know, so <laughs> all of the trends that we had been organizing our minds around kind of went out of the window, and we had to rethink the entire world. Um, so once that was kind of underway back in 2023, remember that year? <laughs> I think we're still here. <laughs> it's still happening. Um, we were approached by Marriott and their partners, PCMA and SEMA, which is Corporate Event Marketing Association, uh, to revisit where they had been on their trends journey uh, and think a little bit about what it meant in 2023. We wanted to change some things up in terms of how we approached the trends. Uh, the previous reports had um uh, kind of centered a little bit more the kind of Western uh, voices. So we were uh, intentional about going out and ensuring that we had voices from all continents, uh, touching the study, providing their input. Uh, and we really kind of dived deep into a lot of qualitative review. We conducted more than 60 one-on-one -on -one interviews at all hours of the day and night <laughs> to dig into insights pushed outside of the traditional events world to get broader input from the, um, the kind of new and extending definitions of what is experience design. And that generated uh, nearly 2000 unique insights uh, that fed into this report. Uh, to help synthesize all of that data, that qualitative information, we then moved to a model of uh, global roundtables. They were held virtually and in person. And it's that in-person one that uh, Josh took part in uh, here at the Marriott uh, headquarters. And uh, the it really kind of built on this wonderful partnership um, of bringing these voices together. You can see on, the, on this slide here, lots of lovely humans that took part in, um, in that conversation, specifically in uh, the round table that Josh was a part of. We were just giggling actually off, uh, off before this call about Josh's avatar, his AI, his AI generated 
there. <laughs> uh, so we had just a, a lot of um, voices from, you know, corporate side, from, you know, what is experience, employee experience, event experience, exhibit experience, um, the visitor centers, just a lot of different points of view contributing to the conversation. And one of the things, major things that came up for us is kind of this first port of call uh, was a degree of fatigue around the idea of trends. You know, I mentioned right, each year there's this onslaught of trends that we have to plan around the 10 C's or the five things beginning with the letter P that we have to um, acknowledge and work around in order to feel like we're really getting it. Um, and, you know, folks, especially post pandemic, when we were asking them to comment through the lens of change, uh, were letting us know in those interviews that trends weren't cutting it for them. You know, if they're thinking about organizing their resources as a corporation, as a group, um, their intention getting rolled out to their teams, it had to have meaning, it had to be more than a trend. So we started using the language of truths. And we actually, at the round table, we had this fun exercise where everybody voted, is this a trend or is it a truth? Is it a fast trend or a slow trend? And got people really involved in, in that conversation as thinking about, you know, is this a North Star? Is it really that guiding principle that is gonna guide us, not just in 2023 until the next round of trend reports come out, but on an ongoing basis, this is something that we can organize our intentions around um, and really uh, use it as a series of benchmarks that help to inform the way that we assess and measure our process, progress. So at a high level, <laughs> that, that was what brought us to the trends. And I'm going to, or the truths, <laughs> that's the case maybe, my first rule out of the window, uh, the six truths. We landed on um, exploring identities, emotional data, designing belonging, the value of values, architecting choice and the power of play were all truths that we heard about with great resonance in, in the conversations that we were having. And so my presentation today is gonna to move quickly through these. It's intended to be an introduction. There is a larger document, much longer, um, that I will give everybody the link to download at the end of the presentation that you can go through with this. But yes, we are really, we're talking about those truths, not trends to cut through the noise and really help us comprehend and analyze and assess where and how we're gonna drive experience innovation. Okay, so first up, let's talk about uh, exploring identities. This is really about connecting the intersections that make us both unique, but also globally and inextricably connected to one another. Right. I think uh, it's uh, for experienced designers, there's uh, an increased awareness for our audiences that we need to know about where um, audiences are really kind of digging into the intersections of their multifaceted identity. Right. Audiences come to the experiences they create and they are looking to find their people to make connections that have meaning. Again, in a post pandemic world, a lot of it comes down to this meaning making. Um, we heard about how network tribes are emerging that help us to find like minds outside of our normal community bubbles. And this is something that was accelerated and amplified, especially during uh, the pandemic and all of the isolation and the virtual connectivity that came with that. So the role of the event designer and strategist is going to be concerned with reimagining networking and expanding beyond the event to experiences more generally, we're thinking about how to make those connective experiences. How do the experiences we create support and facilitate our audiences as they make connections outside of the comfort of the familiar? So there's a little bit of a tension here. On the one hand, we've got the ease and comfort that comes with connecting within our local communities. And on the other hand, the great benefit of making connections outside of our regular environments, bubbles, comfort zones, right? So while we're out there looking for people like us, Marcus Collins calls them network tribes. When we go deeper and make the effort to connect with people who are not on the face of things, 
like us or from a place like us, the result of that is innovation and insight and more meaningful networks being built. The Medici effect says that innovation happens at the intersection of ideas, concepts, and cultures. So this means that networking and connection as a part of experience design has to consider comfort, the role of comfort, or more specifically, how we support tolerances of discomfort and design methods to support audiences outside of their comfort zone. So we're really asking you to consider how might you design experiences that allow attendees to network across multidimensional scales of identity? How would this truth prompt you to rethink your approach to networking. Some of the things that we heard about was the people that have spent that extended time abroad are more creative problem solvers, right? So there is this connection to getting away from that place that you came from that helped to make you. Um, but then there's also a conversation between, you know, how does your local identity infuse and intersect with global identities? You know, how do, how do you kind of uh, traverse that gap? So some of the how, some of the directions on what this might mean, some of the tactics, uh, you know, we can create our own profiles, we can co-create galleries, we can dedicate docents for specific identities and experiences. Uh, we can really get people involved in this work of connecting with one another. But first of all, we have to create the spaces for those connections to occur. So when we're building experiences, how are we creating spaces specifically intended to allow people to explore their identities individually and together? Okay. I'm going to move at a fairly fast clip because I've got a few to cover here. We can come back, like, you know, in the q and I'm happy to do that. Um, the second uh, truth I'm going to talk about today is emotional data. This is one that I love. Um, uh, mainly because it reflects the considerable shift in how business is regarding emotion, right? Emotion was once seen as something that was kind of seen to limit sound logic, right? And instead of that, you know, emotions are now being seen as a key to driving loyalty and important decision making. So the notion of emotion <laughs> has gone on quite a journey and evolution when we think about business and experience and how those things connect. So for experienced designers, for the strategists behind the experience, there's much to be discovered about how we're making use of this data. How do we collect it? When and where and how are we collecting it? How do we measure it consistently? How do we, um, as we start to collect it and measure it, create benchmarks? And then what can we glean from its analysis? I think it's all pretty exciting stuff. Um, like many of the truths that I'm sharing today, uh, they're kind of active and sustained because they really do directly impact business. At the end of the day, it does come back to this virtuous cycle um, of how we support the work of experience design. And emotions especially are directly connected to decision-making, to spurring actions, to generating behaviors. So how do we assess emotion? Well, experienced creators are leaning in to measuring sentiment. This is often one step removed from a quantitative assessment, the traditional use of keywords and emojis. Um, and this means shifting kind of when our data collection occurs. In the world of experiences and events, we've tended to ask those questions uh, about experience after the experience, right? How was that for you? Did we get you uh, closer to being inspired, you know? Uh, and it's quite unique because in a lot of industries, those questions begin before the experience or before the event. You know, think about going to see a, uh, a massa, for example. T tell me about what your pain points are. Where's it hurting? What are you What are you looking to get out of today? What are your preferences for this, right? Um, experience, event, exhibit design, a lot of it tends to ask the questions after instead of before. So as we're looking at collecting emotional data, one of the things we're seeing is a shift at when that collection occurs, right? Because post-event data is becoming less useful to us. We're starting to ask those questions before or at the event in the moment. 
And with emotional data collection, that also leads us to wonder about data fidelity, right? How do we assess those in the moment emotions that might be heightened as opposed to those that do actually form a kind of lasting sentiment that can be measured uh, post event. So there's this really interesting conversation with uh, emotional data and that collection where we're experimenting. A lot of these truths are future focused. So we're looking at the industry and kind of seeing how we're working this out as, as designers right now, right? And what does that mean um, for innovations in the way that we design? Now, what we are finding as we're starting to collect this emotional data is that all of the data collection does rely on an audience that is willing to take part in the survey, in the, in the conversation. So this means that we have to find ways to um, really involve data in, in an open way in the, in the conversations that we have with our audiences. We have to find ways to return the data to the audience. They're, usually very, very interested to see the data that's been collected. And in the past, it's kind of been hidden, you know, behind the curtain. Um, we have to clarify why we're collecting this data, how we hope to use it, why it's important for us, what, what it's going to be used for, um, and really get people comfortable, especially when it comes to emotional data, get them comfortable sharing their emotional state, right? How do you feel? You know, that's not often a question that has been asked a lot in the moment. So when you do that as an experienced designer, you do tend to gather more data and then we kind of go off on this journey, a rabbit hole journey of what do we do with this? How do we use it? Um, so we're finding ways to empower the audience to own their own zero party data, especially now in a world which uh, the cookie is dying. We're looking at that kind of preference data, the data that the audience shares with you, uh, and really be thoughtful about why they're exchanging that data with you, the experience creator. There's a value to it. So um, as experienced designers, we're encouraging everybody to investigate what it's gonna take to ensure that your audience feels comfortable. There's that word about comfort again, sharing their data, confident in the reason that they're being asked for it, and curious about how their input is going to manifest in the experience design. We've got to do something to show people why uh, we're valuing their input. You know, uh, you gave us, you said this, and here's what we did as a result. It's simple but powerful as a way of incentivizing that sharing. Um, you know, we are seeing, and, you know, here on the, the why and the how, I've got a screen up here. If you see my eyes wandering, it's because I'm <laughs> referencing that. Um, you know, the, we're, we're seeing a, a, a big delta, a big difference in that kind of in-person surveying, more responses as opposed to post. And we're also seeing certain frameworks coming up as a return on emotion framework that says that events scoring 8.6 and above on five key emotions actually translate into increased sales pipeline, which is really nice um, to be able to kind of point to that value. Um, and people are willing to share their data just as long as they know that there is some benefit to them of doing so. Lots of different ways to start collecting that emotional data and to start kind of having that conversation with your audience pre-event um, uh, that are listed here as well. All right, let's also talk about choice, architecting choice. And this is the... Uh, engagement of agents in creating their adventures, right? Shaping their experience and really helping to simplify the sometimes complex experiences that we create for them. Um, so architecting choice as a, uh, as a truth reflects the audience's desire for choice and a willing a really a kind of clear wish to be involved in the process of choice. So we're hearing audiences like say to us, we wanna make the choices, but we need you, the experience designers to simplify and make those choices clear for us, right? Inform us so that we can make informed choices. So this represents for us as experienced creators, the a, a shift away from um, 
uh, this mode of kind of controlling really defined outcomes towards a new role as curators of choice. These moments at which an experience can diverge and we're providing a series of pathways. And how do we think about those journeys where they reconverge, where they go again, you know, those moments um, along the journey. So it's really kind of being very choiceful about the choices that we give. For our audiences across industries and verticals, uh, this space of kind of the role of choice is a space of rapid evolution in the past five years. Um, and, you know, we were seeing a lot of input um, in the conversations that we had specifically around what it meant to return to the office, right? So if we think about employee experience um, and, and, and the, the role of choice there, I think we're all seeing, you know, what does it mean to work virtually, to have a kind of hybrid work style? What does it mean to come into the office and this question around how do we choose to engage in that office environment? Um, so for us in experience design, it does mean that we need to allow for formats that have a flexibility of uses and purposes. And when we're giving people choices for different tracks, what are the implications um, in the choice that they're making? How can they revisit? You know, do they have the option to change their mind? Um, it does in the world of museums it, um, and other kind of more narrative experience spaces. It does give people a reason to return back and experience uh, the design uh, from a different perspective time on time. So it's not just a singular experience. There, you know, one of the really interesting uh, things that we found was that the benefits of architecting for choice include engagement, inclusion, and happiness, right? AKA well being. In fact, the Journal of Happiness reveals that when it comes to happiness, having a choice is key. Simply put, people who choose to be in a certain situation are likely to get more out of it, right? I chose to be here. I have more input um, and I'm, I'm more bought in. Um, but conversely, well-being and that sense of happiness is likely to drop if you're put into situations where you did not have a, a choice <laughs> in that matter. So I think it's, it's really interesting to look at the way that we're thinking about journeys. Um, and there is a balance to strike in the way that we think about choices, offering all of the choices all of the time can lead to a kind of choice paralysis, <laughs> analysis paralysis. So it's not really feasible. It can be a little overwhelming. Um, and there is real value in the experiences that we create in having a sense of curiosity or serendipity and these kind of magical moments that occur that maybe weren't directly selected, but were a result of the choices that we made. So kind of that really thoughtful curation of how much choice where it happens, um, how frequently, and you know where we also choose not to um, provide choice as a way of building that experience up. Okay, uh, so if we move over to the next one, designing belonging. Oh goodness, no, so designing belonging is, uh, it's actually as a truth, something that runs as a, a current, a connective thread between everything that we heard. You know, it emerged as such a pervasive truth that it underpins the majority of the new principles in design. Um, but it was so present that we wanted to give it a kind of dedicated space just to talk about belonging itself. Um, belonging is a mission. We heard about it being a measurement. Uh, we heard about it being central to the meaning and even the magic of the experiences that we create. Uh, and while belonging is omnipresent, this particular truth, when we talk about it here, is going to focus on how responses to the ascendance of belonging is going to significantly impact the future of experience design. You know, belonging being defined as a strategic goal and a, a driver of intentional design is relatively new. The idea of inclusion, of course, is not new, right? But the notion of understanding inclusion as something that is experienced as a sense of belonging, right? The belonging is the output of the work of inclusion, something that we can design to create as a state of being, as opposed to fulfilling a set of codes or checklists or standards to meet 
is a new development. You know, we see this as being a long lasting driver of intentional design strategy. Um, in the experience design world, we're hearing a lot of conversation about that now. And it's one of the primary reasons for this is that we are seeing data directly stating that belonging is good for business. There are some really um, important facts and figures that are coming out and getting cited by folks like Forbes and HBR. In a recent study, higher belonging was leaked, li linked with uh, a 167% increase in a willingness to recommend to others. So in marketing speak, we can understand that if somebody is looking to grow, to 2x their growth, accessing that sense of belonging is going to be fundamental to achieving that. So belonging might be considered both an altruistic and a business goal, <laughs> which makes it all the more important to engage your audience in an authentic dialogue about what belonging means to them and how your experience design can help them on their belonging journey. So Storycraft Lab, kind of in tandem to this report, has also been doing a lot of work with Google's Experience Institute to dig into these definitions of belonging. And what we're finding there uh, is, again, another kind of simple but quite lovely idea, that the, the act of creating space for a conversation about what belonging means actually sparks a sense of belonging within a community. It's simple, but it's elegant. In human terms, it means that you care enough to ask. And then you have to listen and respond to what your audiences are telling you about what belonging means to them. So as a result of all of this, we're seeing the belonging ascendancy producing a new era of reflective and self-aware belonging centered design where the human is still at the center of our intention, but we're creating belonging for and with them. There's a growing understanding that if we can get to belonging, we can produce a desired result, whether that is an action, an engagement, a feeling, a sentiment, a recommendation. Uh, designing the experiences that facilitate belonging do begin with that dialogue with your audience, right? So, and we're seeing this now and it will continue in coming years. Experienced designers and strategists are really seeking the methods, the media, the metrics that will extend their audience dialogue. The value of values responds to the broadening set of criteria that audiences assess when determining whether and how to participate in your experience. So audiences are looking for experiences that provide value beyond the dollar and design choices like sustainability, venue selection, diversity, hybrid channels, communities, time, uniqueness. These are all elements that we heard about making up the new value of that investment of somebody's energy and time and commitment when they come to the experience. So this is not about the business ROI that organizations are considering traditionally, but rather it's ROI from the audience perspective. It's the personal ledger of an individual. These criteria are made up of three segments, beginning with the needs and core values uh, of an individual, those key aspects of our being that shape how we see and navigate the world. Then how those values are made manifest by the experiences that we create. Audiences have a new sentience when it comes to this choice to engage. There's an awareness and a desire for experience design choices and actions that really represent as an audience member who I am right, and express this as almost like an activist sentiment. It's how I want to shape the world and how does my participation convey that to others. This is not a passive desire to be a part of uh, doing good more generally, but it's really an activist sentiment to create meaningful change. Now, finally, we've heard so much about how the values of time and community are evolving as a currency. These were kind of consistent units of measurement that came up for people that shaped their perception of value. Uh, because of this, opportunity exists to us in the world of experience creation, especially when we think about um, events, to offer unique experiences that respond to specific values. 
Uh, those creative offerings may even generate new sponsorship or partnership models, which I think is um, really exciting <laughs> uh, to behold. So uh, audience is really asking experienced creators to tell them and show them <laughs> how they really do care about these values. They're also holding experienced creators accountable right, for those values that they say matter to them. They're assessing how brands and organizations will truly walk the talk beyond the marketing message to embody meaningful change. It's no longer okay to say that you are pro-diversity and then have all of your SVP level and above be all white or all male or, you know, people are looking at that detail. Um, we've seen it on social media with um, various different kind of uh, activist voices getting involved and, and not then not being followed through uh, and supported by the organization. And, you know, it's, uh, it's destructive when people get it wrong. Right. Um, but it also holds great opportunity for us as long as we're examining our communications and our messages to ensure that they really are authentic with the organizational values as well. OK, and then finally, let's talk about the power of play. Yes. Sorry, Josh, I'm running long. I promised you it was going to be a half an hour. But, uh, I'm nearly done. I promise. <laughs> Usually I do this with friends so people don't have to listen to my voice for too long. Uh, power of play is a compelling design mindset. It benefits wellness, it benefits innovation, it benefits productivity. Play connects function and experience. It helps to catalyze content, to build teams, to define cultures, introduce new ideas, uh, synthesize learning, spark joy. It does so much. You know, and audiences really do want to get hands on and be free to tinker especially as we're coming back to those face-to-face um, -face experiences. And in the virtual setting, people are also asking for this. You know, how do we um, make sense of new concepts, use technology or um, even kind of the low, low tech options to um, uh, get hands-on, tinker, play and access all of the insights that come from that testing and experimentation with others. Um, in our discussions of play, we heard three sub themes emerge the connection between play and productivity, uh, the benefits of play as an activity and a mindset, its connection with happiness, with team dynamics, with innovation. And then there was the kind of programming of play, right? Um, in the events world, we tend to have. Uh, pretty highly developed run of show right? uh, that every moment is controlled in terms of its alignment with a content message being delivered um, but play asks us to consider what happens when we don't control outcomes what happens when we simply allow people to access joy uh, we heard a lot about the phenomenon of positive resonance and really got excited about how the 20 percent productivity boost that results from the joy of play could actually do some work to help offset the 4.8% drop in productivity from a sense of post-pandemic ennui. You know, people are still <laughs> struggling with that shared trauma. But when we allow people to play, we can move beyond that. It is healing. Um, you know, finally, we discussed play as a space for testing, tinkering, investigating with new tools. And here there is great value in play spaces that allow us to make sense of new tools by getting creative. Of course, AI is top of mind, right? Um, how do we kind of bring AI into experiences that allow people to play? Um, and our research indicates that experience design is going to be a place that allows us all to engage with a AI and really discover that new creative collaborator. And Josh, I remember at the round table, you said AI is going to be your new best friend. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Think of them as a team member, right? What can they unlock for you as a human? Um, so this truth really asks us to consider how do we design those spaces where play and joy can thrive? How do we let go of some of the parameters so that it can flourish? But well, starts by just giving yourself permission to be messy and authentic, um, permission to seek and to make fun. What joy. <laughs> uh, so that's uh, 
There you go. That, those, those were the six, the six truths. I'm, I'm going to stop here because I've talked for an awfully long time. Um, but it was, you know, it's been really interesting to see as we've activated those this past year, we've taken them into a series of lab spaces and allowed people to get hands on. Um, so obviously we've been helping people to think about these truths, but we're also seeing it happen beyond within the industry. So kind of tracking with a lot of that and bringing people into the conversation as well. Okay. All right. Thanks, Naomi. This is fantastic. Um, so I will, if anybody has any questions, drop it into the, uh, the Q and a, um, or the chat. Um, I was going to actually just queue up a few, a few, uh, ones just to start actually. Um, you know, I thought there were some really interesting, there's like, there's a lot of really interesting threads here. Um, I guess one of the questions I have is like, how, you know, how is this being operationalized at, at, um, at, at, uh, Marriott, like, or, or, you know, how, how are they mm -hmm. taking this and then applying it to how they do events, how they, you know, maybe think about, you know, their experience in, in various like platforms. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, what we've been doing this past year is taking it into a series of educational engagements. So we've been working with their teams internally to unpack for them. A lot of it internally is like, how does this apply to the world of hotels and hospitality? Yeah. Right. You know, what what do we do with that information? So we've been um, goodbye, Jason. <laughs> uh, the uh, the. So we've been doing a lot of trainings and those have actually kind of moved um, throughout Latin America. We've been delivering the presentations in Spanish language and then uh, we've also delivered them in Europe as well as in, in the States. Um, some of the consulting that I've, I've done and kind of working with hotels, looking at the choices that they offer uh, to attendees. How do I organize spaces? What are my options for creating different journeys within this venue right it kind of gamifies the entire hotel when we're looking at um you know where is it we're bringing people together and then when they split off on their different journeys so there's been some support internally to look at kind of what that means for the individual venues um they've also really lent into the idea of uh belonging they've partnered with uh, the new project which is all about neuro inclusion oh yeah uh, yeah yeah so they've done a lot of work there and they're adapting that neuro inclusion checklist from the new project uh to apply to the hotel experience as well um I presented recently with Glenn Stress from uh, from Marriott uh, to talk about the power of play, and that involved a lot of slime um, as a way. Of just <laughs> I saw I saw Slumu is one of the uh... Slumu. Yes, they're amazing. By yeah, the way, my, my 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 seven year old daughter is like obsessed with them. We we I spent yeah. a fortune in their uh, their New York uh, space. Well, they're opening up venues all around America and into Europe now as well. So um, she'll be able to access a slumo wherever she goes, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, it has been really interesting to see them consistently bring into these professional experiences things like slime or Legos or, you know, just getting people um, involved in the work of playing. And, you know, I've seen some pretty buttoned up business executives connect and get loose in a way that doesn't involve alcohol it's like you're before the five o'clock mark and connecting with one another in a really kind of joyful way there is I tell you what there's a there's a moment when you put your hands into a big bucket of slime with four complete strangers where your eyes just meet and you have a like what are we doing right now kind of thing. Um, and then the the conversation just flows from there so it's um they they have been taking each one of these truths and looking at the different yes brian it, it is quite it's delightful um and funny to work uh to to watch uh happen um so they they have been kind of putting this consistently into their events um the exploring identities there's been an exercise called the identities ikigai um which uh has been rolled out in various different conferences and just gives people a safe place to ha start having those conversations um as well it's it's funny that you mention alcohol because i i think about like okay like what is what is all this like in contrast to like what were like the old truths that you had to dispel exactly. you know yeah 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 and you know i think that there's um the the 
the play component especially is it's how you get loose and unlock that side of yourself without having to abuse your system yeah. you know it does it uh it you know it unlocks a sense of a new sense of energy and connectivity and yeah it's yeah. it used to be just all about you know going and getting stuff <laughs> Well, no, it's, yeah. yeah, no, I mean, my background, you know, is is more like the museum, like the institutional, yeah. experience, you know, and like, and, you know, I just think about, you know, kind of, uh, you know, like the, the structures that are in place and like the truths that are the sort of implicit truths in the visitor experience, um, you know, that, that are, that are not really about play. It's not really about even designing for emotion. A lot of times it, it's really about delivering information. It's about creating a, in, and, you know, and like, I, I think that it's very interesting to have a new framework to kind of disrupt some of those old patterns. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it does, it does unlock um, in the, in the business setting, it unlocks that act of experimentation and synthesis, right? Yeah. Which is why it's been so valuable in the museum um, and institutional side. And I think kind of in the, in the business setting, we have struggled for a while with, you know, how to do that um so this is this is it's exciting to see people get playful very nice uh phil did you have a question yeah sure um back on your um emotional data session section uh one of the slides read that pcma is using a service to do uh, facial recognition to monitor yeah. emotions. Are they disclosing that or have people become so used to having their camera on that just the you're being recorded is enough? Yeah, and I've, I've seen Zenus uh, software get used at a number of different events. There's usually a notification that, you know, this is getting recorded. Um, so people have the option not to participate. And there are, you know, what ends up happening, uh, the way that Zenus works is that they don't capture, there you go, Thank you, Rachel. It's sentiment analysis as opposed to kind of full on facial recognition. They don't capture any um, personal information, um, but what they can do from that sentiment analysis is read the emotions um, that are being displayed facially. And then they do also kind of tie that back to kind of rough ideas of some demographics that go alongside it, you know, what generation this person might be. Um, uh, but it's uh, it's really about that kind of emotional read in the moment. So in some of our lab sessions, we set the cameras up to really kind of get a sense of um, uh, how people were feeling with a particular interactive or a particular conversation. Um, and for speakers as well, when they're using that sentiment analysis, it was... Uh, you could get a feel of when the audience was laughing, right? Or when the audience's eyes were wandering or when, um, will you share that report from reading the sentiments? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, yeah, you got to, you got to see a lot of, a lot of that information in, in, you could kind of track it to the journey and the, and the presentation of what was hitting and when, um, uh, they, they have a case study on their website actually that would, show you know they might say the kind of millennial generation started to laugh at this moment but other generations may not have laughed maybe they didn't get that joke or there was a moment at which this particular group started to kind of drop in terms of their attention their eyes dropped maybe their phones came out that kind of thing as well you know you know I mean, one of the things that i think is really interesting is you know um I, I, again, I keep Im imposing this back into sort of like the museum experience or, you know, or like even an, even an event experience that has a lot of like information to deliver, you know, and, and you'd mentioned somewhere that there's like the experience that people have at the time and then the experience that people have later. I I'm also very curious about like, like learning outcomes, you know, like, you know, and then I, like, I, it also makes me think about the Van Gogh projection experiences, you know, like those, like, I'm sure they have a like very high sort of like emotional states and belong senses of belonging and joy, but like, I don't know if people leave like knowing anything like actually substantive about Van Gogh. Um, so like, I, I wonder like, how do you, you know, how do you think about that? Like, how do you think about the learning outcomes and like some of those other things that, that mm. also need to be sort of packed into those experiences? Yeah. You know, and I think that that, um, you know, we're starting to move beyond this idea that it's one and done with our audience, right? So it's in the moment we are going to teach them everything that they need to know that we've been saving up curatorial for the last 10 years. And if they don't get it when they leave, then 
goodness, you know, what are we going to, but did they leave feeling inspired to learn more? Mm, and how yeah. are we as museums and experienced creators giving them the avenue to continue their content journey? Um, I think that's also something that I've learned from the neuro inclusion work as well as the, you know, everybody learns differently. Sometimes some people do require several visits back to the source material um, that, you know, if you try and kind of um, uh, put it all in a fire hose in two hours or less, that's not going to be a model that is successful for them. So I think it's challenging us to um, think about that kind of exhibit or experience as a, a one moment in time uh, and how it lives on, you know, and is supported by these other media and channels that kind of run concurrent. And it's okay for somebody to touch into a subject in the live environment, leave inspired to learn more someplace else, you know, that it starts to open up a whole series of content journeys that can then to your point, Josh, be extended to a much more deeper and resonant learning experience yeah right you know um yeah, yeah i don't know I, I totally and i think some of it is also just like almost like the ergonomics of those experiences because it's like you know you can if you're sitting in your bed watching a two-hour documentary like that's a very comfortable place to consume that amount of information like rather than like standing in a museum and reading a thousand labels okay oh we have a question um <laughs> would you do you want to go on camera on and ask that yourself or do you want me to Sure, I'm happy to. I know it's a long question. Sorry. So I, I love all these ideas. And it's funny, as we attend, like I just attended IMAX last week. And every time I go to PCMA, I always feel like I walk away very inspired, or there's things that I see that really <clears throat> resonate with me and gives me thought about changes that we need to implement in our annual citywide. But what we often keep running up against challenges are uh, leadership not always maybe supporting it because budget or because there's like this old thought process and not just from leadership, but sometimes staff members who have been there way too long, maybe 20 years plus, right? That we've always done it this way. So therefore it must work because our survey results are positive. And, <clears throat> and it's great that our survey results are positive, but in our particular org, 50% of our audience is new each year while 50% of them are returning attendees, not necessarily year over year, but maybe every two or three years. So how do you get leadership support to start implementing these great changes? Okay, so there, I think there's a couple of components to that, right? There's the like the organizational resistance and then there's the budget line item, right? And I think um, to start with the organizational resistance, it means that I, I would encourage you to find a friend. Um, so when I run this kind of scenario mapping workshops, um, it's one of the first steps is figuring out who the stakeholders are that you need to influence to move towards that decision and then find those individuals within your organization. Often, you know, you I, I, Tuesday, you just put together a fantastic argument about 50% of this audience is new, right? So it's your marketing team <laughs> is gonna be able to um, help articulate that comment. And we are starting to see um, fundamental uh, uh, data, the 167% statistic that I presented, you know, if they experience a sense of belonging, they're 167% more likely to recommend, is a huge influencer um, in, in terms of getting people to open up, <laughs> you know, so it's not just a case of do you want to maintain the status quo or it becomes are you looking to 2x your growth, right? Do we want to, this new audience that's coming in, we don't just want to get them here this one year, we want to have them leave and bring their friends next year and continue that growth trajectory. Um, so I would say, first of all, find some friends to help you articulate this so that because the work of a change maker can be exhausting sometimes and tiring and there's nothing to make you feel more crazy than, you know, just speaking into the void. <laughs> so if you can find friends to help you articulate that, I would um, I would encourage that. Um, there's also and, and that can be within your organization, certainly. But um, if you're interested in joining the Google Experience Institute, um, Storycraft Lab are the community moderators there, and, and I can help get you connected to a whole bunch of folks that are doing this work of advocacy, right? Um, and that can also help as well. Look at how this company is doing it, you know? Or I just talked to a friend that has experienced the same challenges. So 
but that those would be my recommendations on the organizational side and honestly i think that once you've overcome those the questions about budget they're all scalable all of these things are scalable right you know i we rented a table the other day and we kind of drew out on a piece of acetate the identities of you guy and we put <laughs> But when we were presenting it within the, the Google booth, um, it was a very nice table, you know, it had internal illumination and there were like cute little shaped things that have been cut out, you know, uh, there was a there was a degree of production value, but like the most important thing is that those things are happening, um, that there's a space for those conversations to occur. Uh, and I, I would say that that's true with with all of these. Um, it's it's about kind of carving out some space for those interactions and and conversations, um, and just start somewhere. Like you don't have to do all six of the truths at all points touch points. It's about saying, "Gosh, I really need to figure out the pre event awareness, right? And what are some just a couple things I could do there." Um, and then you measure the impact that those moments have had. And it starts to kind of in an iterative way, open up, make make the argument a lot less taxing <laughs> in terms of convincing folks. Because you'll, you know, every new thing you try, you'll find new um, advocates within your org as well. Yeah. Great. Thank oh, you so much. That was wonderful. wonderful. Thank you. I was at Amnet uh, as well last week and it was wild. It was wild. I, it's taken me a minute. <laughs> Still digesting it. Yes, <laughs> that's a lot. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. All right. So, uh, Chrissy, is that a is there a question? Oh no, that's or more of a comment. There, any? Uh, I think we have room for one more question. I wish I had a question, Sarah Shrex. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, you know, I, I guess one of the, I, I guess I, I just wanted to maybe pick up on one thing that you said uh, right there, which was start somewhere. And I think I really love this idea of like prototyping some of these things and just. I think this is a really nice little guy, like set of guidelines. And like, you know, they're just like little ideas that I think probably picking up one or two of them and trying something is probably like a great place to start. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that, um, what you'll find is that uh, the idea of a focus group, oh, we want to try and do something around belonging. Bring some of your super users or even your kind of aspirational attendees into a Zoom call like this and have them brainstorm with you, prototype, share an idea and get their reactions. It, you will be amazed at the kind of positivity that come and the energy that comes out of that simple act of asking people to get involved in the process. They will leave feeling like they're your advocates. Um, you will leave with more information. Um, you can be darn sure that they're going to turn up to your experience because they're going to want to see how <laughs> their input uh, manifested, right? Um, and, and that's about just carving out a little bit of time at that point um, to, to convene and just be that voice that says, hey, let's spend some time thinking about this. Yeah. And I just also want to say, as, as someone who's actually experienced one of the, uh, the Storycraft Lab uh, workshops, it was really fantastic. And actually, I, uh, Klaus, who's one, we had Ryan as a previous speaker, and yes. Klaus going to be doing one in the future. Uh, it was a really amazing gathering of people, and you guys did an amazing job facilitating. Um, okay, I think that's probably it for today. Naomi, thank you so much. That was really fantastic. I really appreciate you sharing with us today. I'll put this video up uh, as soon as I can. <laughs> as soon as you can. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank so you. Much. And thank you everybody for uh for joining. I hope to see you guys uh, next week and in the future. See you again soon. <laughs> Bye now. Bye. Thank you. See you. Bye guys. Bye everyone. <laughs>